your kid from Mendham, New Jersey, and you're watching your friend go through this. Realizing that basically her family, everything that she knew was destroyed. We went and looked at the school that she would have gone to, and it was just ramshackle. Just the hard work of growing everything that you consume. You want salt, you're carrying it three days in like we did. Or if you have like a, any kind of pests come in, you're just not gonna eat. Seeing the close-knit community, but also hearing stories of the war and what people were up against and what it had done to women and children and just how people had suffered was also really raw and real. I remember having this sense that whole first trip, like, oh, I wanna do something here. I wanna be here, I wanna, I don't know what, but I feel that this is the time to be in Nepal and try to make things better. Welcome to Cause and Purpose, the show about leaders, innovators, and change agents working on the front lines to solve some of the world's greatest social challenges. I'm Mike Spear, and today's guest is Maggie Doyne. Maggie is the co-founder and CEO of Blink Now, a nonprofit organization that runs a school, a children's home, a health clinic, and a women's center in the foothills of the Himalayas in Sirket, Nepal. The Blink Now story began when Maggie, basically just taking a gap year between high school and college to travel, came face to face with the horrific aftermath of the Nepalese Civil War. At just 18 years old, Maggie crossed over the border between India and Nepal on foot on a quest to help her friend Sunita reconnect with friends and family impacted by the war. What she discovered was hundreds of children, many of whom were orphans, as their only means of providing for themselves and their families. She instantly fell in love with the Nepalese community she found herself in, and with the help of Sunita, Sunita's Uncle Tope, and the $5,000 she'd saved up from babysitting, she launched Blink Now, and the rest is history. Who is Maggie Doyne, and who, who was she like as a kid growing up? Were you, were you very engaged with social impact? You know, what were you like when you were younger? To kind of describe who I am and who I was, I think it's important to like explain suburban New Jersey. We Jersey girls have quite the reputation. No, so I grew up in this really suburban town, not much diversity. Everybody commuted into New York City, had corporate jobs. I went to a public school where from the time you're in seventh grade, they're like, college, 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 where are you going? When you get into college, it's posted, like in the newspaper, like it's announced. And there was a lot of pride in our town around like, who got into the Ivy League and like the tiers and where you're playing. It's like what everyone asks when you're in the grocery store. And at some point you're like, I don't want to go over to my friend's house because their parents are going to grill me on where I'm applying. And my mom was a nurse. My dad was a teacher. They, you know, fought to have us in this town for the good public schools and the soccer teams. I'm one of three girls. We had a dog. I played soccer. I was a good student. Just normal teenage girl thinking that you work hard. You've been given a lot of opportunity shoot for the stars, go to college and follow the dotted line. And that was, that was me. I had every opportunity and chance in the world, really, to have a happy childhood, to be given a free public school education, to be surrounded by good teachers and coaches and mentors. And everything is kind of like the definition of privilege and luck. Absolutely. You'd expressed to me when we spoke last week, felt very directed of like, here are the steps that you follow to be a successful human being. You'd express feeling a little bit trapped by that and kind of wanting to to find your own path. Yeah. At some point, I think I started to question like, so is that it? Like I just go to college and then my destiny is made. I don't know. I didn't really feel like I had any agency over it. It was just like, this is what's going to happen. And I never questioned it. And all of a sudden I was turning 18 and all my college applications were off. And I was just like, wait a second. I know nothing about who I am, what it is I want to be, what I want to do with my life. And I'm about to go spend all my parents and my money for years to come and take loans out and just like go figure this out at a university. And I was just like, no, I think I need to do more. I think I need to see more. I want to learn more about myself. I want to figure out what my interests are. And and then that led me to the decision to just take a gap year out of, there was nothing in me that was like, I'm going to go, you know, change the world. Or I was not woke at all. It was just like, okay, I have never really left New Jersey. I don't know what I want to do. I'm kind of burnt out from being this all achieving work as hard as you can 
dot all your I's and cross your T's girl. And I'm going to try to travel. And there was gap year programs and I found one and it was awesome. And I loved it. (laughs) Tell me about the program. What was it? And where did you go? There was this program out of Princeton called Leap Now. It was lifelong education alternatives and programs. And um, the initial semester was in the South Pacific. And you've got 12 kids with their backpacks and you're, you know, scuba diving and learning how to surf and learning Buddhism on a Buddhist monastery and meditation and backpacking and outdoor survival skills and um, a little bit of cultural immersion. You know, we stayed in a amazing Fijian fisherman's village and immersed ourselves in the culture there. It was just, there's so much beauty and learning that comes out of travel, especially when, you know, you can draw a circle around your upbringing and I hadn't been exposed to much and it just really opened my eyes and I got a lot of passion back and I was excited and learning so many things and having so much fun. And that was that. Do you have any like culture shock uh, coming from Jersey and landing in the South Pacific? Mostly my eyes were just wide open and I was so like, wow, the world is so big and I'm just a little teeny tiny speck in all of this. And maybe that's just that age that you're in anyway. But all of a sudden there were just so many books I wanted to read and so much to learn and so many other cultures. And it was like a bubble broke. It was like, there's so much to see and do and be. And I was awake, like really awake and excited. As part of the LEAP program, Maggie and her cohort had the opportunity to intern with organizations in various regions they visited. She and a friend decided to intern together, and kind of on a whim, they chose Northern India. The program that we were placed in that was taking volunteers and needed help was called Ramana's Garden. And it was kind of model of the program was that there was a little cafe restaurant that generated income and the kids would intern there and there was a bakery. It was in Rishikesh, so that was kind of where the yoga community was. So she was looking for volunteers to come live on site and help run the cafe and help like with maintenance and just things around basically like just free low level labor. But it was on the facilities of amazing school. And and because of like the income and the outreach that this program did, they were doing all these incredible things in the region and working with school kids. And there was a huge Nepalese refugee community. And I was working with a lot of Nepali people. And so just through that experience, long story short, the director who was running the program, I kind of just like moved up in the ranks. Like I went from scrubbing dishes in the back to helping with morning assembly to doing checks at night to like being her right hand and helping her with accounting. And I just, she kind of like took me under her wing and I learned so much and I ended up extending and extending and staying longer. But then as we started working with Nepalese, you hear the stories and you're exposed to the news and it's right across the border. So you're seeing all these people and these kids come in and a lot of trauma from the war and intercepting from bad situations, whether it was trafficking or child labor. So I was seeing it really up close and personal. And all of a sudden it was just on the map for me. I I couldn't have even, I didn't know what Nepal was, what the people were like. And it was living there and becoming so entrenched in that community and in that conversation that I got really curious. What was it about the Nepalese community that you really related to it. I mean, every culture is slightly different and has its own nuances. And I think most of us are naturally drawn to one or another. I'm just, just curious, like, what about the people you met and, and the cultural aspects really became passionate for you? I felt that when Nepalis flee India and come to this, it's a culture and a language and a country that's not their own. And they're a little bit misfits and there's still a caste system in India and they're kind of like the bottom of the barrel and they're misplaced from their home and their language and their culture and their people and their, a a civil war just, it ravages villages, homes, families, communities. But also there was so much love for where they came from and so much pride. And at the same time, like, I think seeing the hardship and for me, it became really personal because I became friends, like really, really close friends with this young girl, Sunita, who is almost my age, a little bit younger. And I guess we were both kind of going through a coming of age in a sense, like she'd left her rural village when she was eight and had all of these questions about where she came from and what was happening. And she really wanted to go back and kind of trace the footsteps of where she came from and find family and reconnect with her village. 
so initially it was just, oh, the two of us are going to go together. And because we knew so many kids and young people that were coming from this particular region, I just got curious about it. But there was a connection. Everybody falls in love with Nepal and Nepali people. Like they're warm and open and welcoming and hospitable and forgiving and kind and joyous. There's a reason why people who go to Nepal and talk about Nepal just absolutely fall in love. And I I think I got a glimmer and a taste of that in meeting people under really difficult circumstances, but that still had that love and pride. And I I didn't understand why people would leave their home and sleep on the side of the road under a piece of plastic. Like it was seeing the meaning and the life of a refugee up close and personal. It was just, it was so far from my own experience. And yet, you know, the people like were just almost like accepted that this was their situation and we're happy and trying to make the most of it in India. And I was kind of like, well, why? What's going on? It's hard to picture, as you said, if you don't see it personally, it is hard to relate. But I think everybody's story is a little bit unique. You're not going to capture the entire situation, but that's how you bring it home to folks. Yeah. What did your parents make of this? Were they supportive of of this? How did how did you communicate what was going on back to them? Well, so the plan was that I was always going to like, I'll do this and I'm going to come back to college. I'm going to defer and I'll, or I'll, you know, I'll do this and then I'm going to reapply. And I think they could see that I was like learning and growing. And there's so much that you get from having like a real life job in the fields. But then I went to Nepal and I really felt like at that time I wanted to get to the source of the problem. And, and it was when I started to talk about moving to Nepal and kind of living there and extending it and a little longer that the, those conversations got really hard and there were lots of questions. And my parents weren't like those parents that were like helicopter breathing down my neck, looking at all my report cards. They were really loving and open, a little bit hippie. So they, were, they weren't like, you need to come home right now, but they were asking good questions. Like, what's your plan? What are you doing? Keep in mind, this all took place around 2005 and 2006, towards the end of the Nepalese civil war a period of extreme violence and political upheaval, during which more than 17,000 people were killed and hundreds of thousands more were displaced internally. Maggie was still just a teenager when she began dealing with this humanitarian crisis head on. Maggie, how was that for you? It seems like it might have been a bit overwhelming at that age. Oh, there was just story after story. I mean, basically people were just sending kids across the border to get them out. A lot of the Maoist rebellion strategy was to recruit child soldiers. The tactic was to start in rural areas, take one child from every house. We were seeing people that had lost parents and family in the ward and people forced to fight. Kids just forced to leave because of the effects of poverty. So yeah, it was it was very much a part of our everyday conversation when you're meeting someone and hearing that story just tragedy but again like love and pride in their country and where they were coming from this yearning to go back and this hope for a future of peace and when the war ended in 2005 2006 people wanted to go home they wanted to get back home and they wanted a return to peace and normalcy because nepal is a beautiful peaceful place so tell me about that first trip uh, that you took across the border. Take us there. What, what was it like as you, as you first started taking in what was going on in Nepal? Well, it was um, physically really grueling, like cold, but then there were mosquitoes biting. And eventually after two days, I think we made it up to the border, crossed over on a, not an ox cart, but like a pony cart got through the border and then you start to climb up into the Himalayan mountains. And eventually the road ended. All we knew, Sunita and I, is that we had to like walk and walk for a really long time. And it was like you'd summit up one mountain that you'd think was the hardest mountain, the highest mountain you'd ever climbed. And then you'd look and there was just like another one, another one, another one, another one. And people were just passing us with their goats and their woven baskets. And it was hard. The Himalayas are like nothing you've ever seen. And those green foothills and the waters cutting through the, the mountains. and again, the people and the colors and the animals, and they're all subsistence farming. So there's this relationship to land and nature and the outdoors. You know, we get there after three days, we're exhausted. And we're looking for kind of information on Sunita's extended family. And we found out that her house that had been taken over and converted during the uh, Maoist rebellion, it just, you're a kid from Mendham, New Jersey, and you're watching your friend go through this realizing that basically her family, everything that she knew was destroyed. 
it did something to me and um and to both of us we went and looked at the school that she would have gone to and it was just ramshackle like roof had been torn off the kids didn't have books most kids couldn't go to school just the hard work of growing everything that you consume you want salt you're carrying it three days in like we did you want anything like sugar tea or something special it's like everything is what you grow or if you have like a any kind of pests come in you're just not going to eat for days at a time seeing the close-knit community and nights dancing by the fire, but also hearing stories of the war and what people were up against and what it had done to women and children and just how people had suffered was also really raw and real. It was a really incredible, powerful trip. Sunita got answers that she was looking for. I think it was an important trip for her. It was an important trip for me. I remember having this sense that whole first trip, like, oh, I want to do something here. I want to be here. I want to I don't know what, but I, I, I feel that this is the time to be in Nepal and try to make things better. It wasn't just Sunita's story that inspired her. The more time Maggie spent in Nepal, the more she became aware of how widespread the problems were and what a toll the war had taken on children in particular. I was, had witnessed like what was happening once kids flee and escape and get across the border in India. And then on the other hand, in Nepal itself, there were children by the side of this one particular riverbed that we were walking across breaking rocks all day, every day. There had started to become development and construction of roads in Nepal. And so kids were being recruited as young as four and five years old to work. I'd say it was kind of like that crossroads moment of, I want to do something here and I want to start on this riverbed. And also just like, what have we done? Like how... How have we come so far as a humanity, as a world, but we still have this. We still have kids who are just losing their parents and getting trafficked across borders and being sold. And I thought, no, I need to stare at this in the face and, and do something. It was during this trip that Maggie met Sunita's uncle Tope, who eventually became her co-founder at Blink Now. So yeah, so we travel. It was this incredible trip. I fall in love with Nepal. I'm like, I want to go do something there. Tope had been, is Sunita's uncle and had been like, was one of those Nepalis that just was like, I want to go back. I want to do something. He'd also been an orphan, really young, had a really hard life, come to India to work when he was 11 years old as a bus porter. So we just started putting our heads together, all of us as like a family. Okay, what are we going to do? And what, what do we need? And at the time, there was a lot of conversation around the greatest equalizer, the greatest like one defining thing you can do to change the trajectory of poverty and violence and in families, generational poverty is school and education, literacy. And so we were like, let's just start on this riverbed and start enrolling kids into school. Maggie and Tope quickly realized, though, that the situation was a lot more complex than they'd originally thought. Rebuilding the school was one thing, but they also had to deal with food insecurity, health, safety, and basic housing, and replacing the income the children earned doing manual labor. Many of the children were orphans as well, having lost their families during the war. So Maggie and Tope took the $5,000 Maggie had saved up from babysitting and incorporated a nonprofit, not just for the school, but for the home the children could live in as well. It was also around this time that the media began to pick up on what Maggie and Tope were doing and became interested in the story of Blink Now. Maggie was featured in Cosmo Girl, which came with a $20,000 prize. She was Glamour's Woman of the Year and won the grand prize at the Do Something Awards. All this led to a lot more funding than she was bringing in with her babysitting jobs. And Maggie and Tobe knew that it was time to evolve the organization. It started with like very organic troubleshooting and problem solving. So you'd be working with kids, you know, everyone was drinking dirty water. And you're like, okay, well, we need to work with water systems and you know, if you're not going to live to the age of five because of an infectious disease as a vulnerable child or an orphan, that's problem number one, right? Number two, nutrition, like food is so critical. Like it helps kids stay in school. You know, it's critical to your learning, you know, social workers that we could have caseworkers like working on therapy and counseling and family development was really critical. It's not just ABC and learning basic literacy, there's this whole other picture of a whole child and this whole child principle and what a child needs to 
thrive and grow within a community because the community is important. The family is important. And each and every story was different, but you could see that there were these key crucial elements that were needed and that led and helped us grow through our program. So the nutrition program was really important. We worked with sourcing from local farmers and that got us into farming and sustainability and raising animals and then having a small medical clinic and the medical clinic were like, okay, we need counseling and a reporting center for all these cases that we're dealing with and um, anything from trafficking to child marriage, um, which was so prevalent. And then and then you kind of build from there and it's like, we started a soccer team and an after school program with arts and we put on school plays and theater in the community. And eventually we realized that women were like really critical piece to the puzzle. And we were taking in um, orphans but also putting kids into school and we realized that women were the caregivers. Women were the ones that were determining the life at home. And it, 99% of the time you want to keep a child within their home and within their culture and their family. So um, we created a women's center. I think after losing like four or five women in the community to suicide, it was very organic. And then we really beefed it up into a strategic plan and started working with partners and collaborators. We built up our board Uh, was critical. We created a small little U.S. team and chapter in New Jersey where I was from and got incubated by the Community Foundation of New Jersey. So um, it's like 10 years of growth and development and learning and following best practices. And Nepal was changing. You know, the, the development sector as a whole, the nonprofit industry is changing. It's evolving. It's growing. And we came along for the ride and learned everything we could and brought on everyone we could to help us. So your team is what now? 120 or so? Yeah, 120 um, between Nepal and the US. I think 10 of us are international and the rest are Nepali. What was that like kind of going from you and Tope to, to building a team like that? You know, how did you create the shared vision with, with the staff and the, the folks that were working hands on? And how did you create the, the culture uh, that you wanted? I think it was really important in the bringing on of folks. Like we started, we were paying like 2000 rupees a month. We, we weren't like a (laughs) well-paying, we were just so small. So it was really critical that people who came were there because they really wanted to be there. I looked at our team one day and I realized like, oh my gosh, so many of these people were either refugees in India or they had lost their parents really young and had really hard, hard life. But then we started like really also looking for talents and folks that were education experts and curriculum development experts and early childhood specialists. And at some point in your maturity, you, you take that turning point and it's such a gift because it's the people who make up the organization. So we hire widows and women who need work whenever we can. And we also have an incredible principal and incredible team of social workers who have sometimes come from Kathmandu or a counselor, groundskeepers, a bus driver. It makes me really proud because employment's such an amazing gift and seeing all of those families and helping build up a community and economy and being one of the biggest employment providers in the region was, was exciting and important. Yeah, I think that's a great segue, actually. How are you thinking about impact and measuring that and reporting on it at this point? Initially, we just, I mean, there's built-in assessments. And that was the hard, that was the hard thing. There's like this thing called the SLC exam and the DLE exam. And your kids have to really perform. It's very South Asian in the sense that like, you don't perform, you're not going further. And it's very road-based. So we were trying to be this like very alternative, hands-on, place-based learning, state of the art, kids sitting at circular tables and nature integration. But also we realized our kids need to perform. Teachers are the critical piece of any puzzle and our teachers are so flippin' amazing. And a lot of women teachers, a lot of a really good teacher trainer named Jaden who came in, a really good principal. And the kids just started like turning heads. They were up there with like the army school and the fancy private schools in the region. And then we were contenders and built in benchmarking. And the kids like were speaking for themselves. All of a sudden they were winning soccer tournaments and poetry competitions and dance competitions. And my daughter won the chess competition. I think it, we created this culture of like, you have a chance and I'll go for it they're getting a full ride from the time they're four years old till the time they're in college and like high code of ethics 
it's really hard to get into the school. You have to present death certificates and um, we do home visits. We work with social workers. We work, we work with the government. So it's a very select group of kids that's getting in. And our whole sort of MO is that we transform that street child into a leader that's winning the chess competition. I think we, both Tope and I, are competitive in that sense of like, if we're going to do this, we're going to go all out. And this is going to be the best darn school you've ever seen. Our kids are going to be amazing. We just like believed in them. And it's called Coppola, which is where children bloom. You know, when you report specific metrics, like to your board or to donors and folks, you know, what, what are you reporting? And I'm curious, like how many kids have you graduated? What are they doing now? Oh, really good question. Yeah, we've graduated almost 150 kids. Um, we track them very closely through our futures program, which is alumni. They get a lot of handholding and support in that transition to adulthood. And yeah, they're becoming school principals in medical school. There are um, a lot of them are in Paul, continuing higher education with scholarships. Um, we report on obviously like them going to these elite colleges and what their grades are and their attendance records and little benchmarking things, but also on child marriage. We've had our losses when it comes to really hard things like child marriage. And we want to look at that. And we don't have a big population. We're a very like targeted group, childhood all the way into early adulthood. We kind of like, like to meet kids where they're at. And for success for some children could mean just like making it to eighth grade and then going on a vocational path and becoming a seamstress or a hairdresser, or a farmer that's using sustainable agriculture. So it's different for everyone. A lot of a lot of times in the population we're working with, it's like don't, you know, stay where you are and stay alive and stay healthy and stay well. So it's all kind of metrics from wellness and health and nutrition and family development, looking at the family as a whole family income, family stability, all the way to our kids that are getting recruited to go to college in the U.S. You alluded to something interesting in there that I think isn't really talked about enough in the social sector. How do you define your target population? Who, who's in, who's out, and why do you define them using that criteria? Such a hard question. We always ask, like, well, what is success? Because we're like, what is quality? Like we'll be sitting in these like strategic sessions. What does quality mean? Like how do you determine what quality is, safety and security? Is it just test scores? And is it just out, like how do you measure an outcome? Uh, to be honest, like we're always having those discussions and trying to figure it out. When we start working with these kids, one of the determining success factors is, and I'm very sad to say this, it's early intervention. You need to get a child before they've missed their critical learning periods, Everything we know about childhood development tells us, sadly, in our foster care system and orphan care and working with vulnerable children that you have to interfere and intervene as early as possible. Because once you miss that critical learning period and nutrition, the risks just increase and increase as the child gets older. So a lot of our model works with that early intervention. We're looking for the most vulnerable four and five-year-olds or three and four-year-olds. Then the sky is the limit because you can pit all of those learning benchmarks and get that whole package and everything that a child needs. Not to say it's impossible when you have an eight or a nine or a 10 year old, we take in those cases, but the earlier you can intervene, the better the outcome from what I've seen. And I hate saying that, but it's true. What happens when you get someone showing up or as a referral or something that's like not a good fit? Yeah, we have a special needs program and a learning lab that's been really good um, and, and a program for kids who did, you know, were late enrollment for various reasons. The hardest thing is that when you're looking at admissions for five-year-olds and four-year-olds, they're all going to be a good fit unless you have a serious disability like blindness or a child's deaf. For the most part, once you get a pool of kids who meet all of these, you know, 10 different criteria and a selection committee doing home visits and interviews, at some point you're just choosing the neediest. Like who do we think is going to need this intervention more than anyone else? Even to, to just to apply into the program, you have to be an orphan. We're able to choose like the neediest of the needy, but at some point your shortlist gets down to 40, 50 kids. And then that's when it gets hard. You start looking at gender, ethnicity, um, what is the child's cast to kind of give that scholarship to the kid that's going to need it the most. It seems like, I mean, there's a lot of emotional components to this, but it, it does seem to me like when it comes down to brass tacks, you, you are making an expected value 
calculation in a way, trying to take the kids that you can make the biggest difference in their lives. You know, we've talked about, do we open up and give out talent scholarships and merit scholarships, but every four-year-old has potential. We have a team of social workers and experts and it's not rocket science. Like you give a child love and loving teachers whole nutritious food and a beautiful all in like all comprehensive curriculum and an after school program and a family counselor and home visits that you know bring the family in you can almost do anything these children it's have so much potential every child wants to learn and go to school and I've had kids that I thought there is no way this kid's impossible he's too damaged he's been through too much why did I do this why did I bring him into our family It's just messing everything up. He's a disaster. It's a mess. He's not going to get better. I've had those thoughts. And every time I'm surprised, I'm like, oh my gosh, that kid's freaking graduating top of his class. Look at him. He's like the most loving, perfect child. I can't believe who he is. Like it's magical. I'm curious. So this is maybe a little harder question. I think it's something nonprofits often don't like to talk about, but I think is a missing and important part of the conversation. Can you share some mistakes you made or things that didn't go the way you wanted them to and kind of how you, you know, what you learned, how you adapted and uh, grew beyond it? Oh yeah. Where do you start? (laughs) (laughs) We've all done it. I mean, it's totally, but for some reason it's like, it's a little taboo in the social Mm -hmm. sector. Oh yeah. It can be taboo to talk about your mistakes. I would say number one, Like I was talking about the thing that made us so special of like being all organic and like, okay, this step and I'll take this step. I love that about us too, but it was just like, there was no real like good planning. We were just like, okay, now we're going to do this. And now we're going to do that without necessarily putting in like the time to like really deeply like research it and think it through. I think I, I suffer a little bit from like some impatience and like, okay, like just do it, make it happen. Blah, 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 blah. Like it needs to be done, get it done. And so like we were building a, a green school and I wanted this school to be like the greenest, most sustainable school in the world. I wanted to build it out of rammed earth because our architect probably really convinced me that this was like an incredible material. And that school took us seven years to build. <laughs> because I wanted it to be like the greenest and the most sustainable. And like, it was this ongoing project of just like, okay, go, 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 go do it. It's going to cost this much. And it's going to be this square footage. Just figure it out as you go along. And I have the seam in my life of like making it before the blueprints there. And there is magic to it. You could argue that, well, the other side of doing things where you have like proposals and permissions and all of this bureaucracy and red tape is also really hard. Seven or eight years in, I needed to be like, okay, no, I need like a really robust plan. And it took me a long time. Now, when I tell you that story of like, then we realized we needed to hire experts. Well, that was learning that and making mistakes that got me to that place of like, no, I need a professional social worker that can help me with this. And I need to have the foresight to like bring on someone with HR experience. And it took me a really long time. I think initially Tope and I were like, oh, we can do it. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll find the right people. But at some point you need to also like really have a plan and hire the right people. You know, being a startup, it just takes a while. You know, we've talked with a previous guest, we talked a lot about human centered design, which is that it's an iterative process. You were in the community figuring out what they need and, that, and, and moving on from there. And certainly you want to make sure that you're not doing any harm or at least minimizing the harm that you're doing. But I think it's a very natural evolution, especially at a startup. Totally. It's, it has worked for us. Like that style of just like, we don't have a lot of money. Let's use what we have, make it stretch as far as it go. Every dollar counts, like ugh, figure it out. If you make a mistake, scratch it over and we do it. It worked for us. It's what's gotten us where we were. I was 19 with $5,000 and a co-founder with a fourth grade education, but had lived this life. And we were like, we're going to figure this out with the people. And I, I, like I said, I love that about us. There are times where I'm just like, oh, you know, you cringe a little. Initially, the women's center, we're like, we put it up above my bedroom. We just like put up some bricks and just did it really quick. And you can always do more. I, I, I'd say my other mistake, and it wasn't necessarily, I wasn't like conscientiously doing it to like create harm. Tope was very like the guy on the ground in Nepal making it work, the problem solver. And I was like the forefront in the face. And we liked that. Like we continue. That's like how we work. 
But all of these years later, I feel sometimes like it became too much of like the Maggie Doyne founder story. I mean, I don't have serious regrets. Like, of course, in every interview, you're like, yeah, but there's this whole team of people around me, surrounding me at every second and making every decision and topes there. But in those initial years, it, it kind of like perpetuate a little bit of like white girl saviorism. I regret that. I've learned a lot since and I've done a lot of work and I kind of wish I had like forced it a little more like, you know, CNN heroes, Tope was there and I was the one that got up on stage because it was, you could only, you know, one CNN hero and my name got put forward. You know, the camera was on him too, but he should have been up there on stage. We went with it. Like it was an agreement that we had and he's loved and he's since won so many Nepal awards and it's the way that we operated best and like our true and equal partnership. Like I speak more English and I write, I do a lot of the writing and the speaking and he's more of like the tactile on the ground with the Nepalese in there, but we talk every day and like we play off of each other's strengths. And I I think sometimes looking back at those stories from the early days, I want to gag a little bit just because it's like Cosmo girl, but then there's like this whole group of Nepali people. Where are they? Where are all the caregivers? I wasn't raising all of those kids alone. I'm still not. There's other house parents there. Sometimes I think you get a little swept away either in in ego, in just like, oh, this is working. So let's just keep going. And we just got a piece and glamour and $10,000 just came in. And now we're going to go like, because you need resources at the same time, looking back and kind of knowing what I know now about privilege and race and the privileges of being white. I, I wish like he had been our whole team had kind of been on the forefront. But again, like, I don't know how we would have changed that. And it, that was the story that we put out and it works. It's hard to talk about. It's sensitive, right? Because you don't want to be like the white savior, whatever cliche. There are ways to do that in a way that's damaging. But what are you supposed to do when you show up in these areas? You know, to a certain extent, like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Like, you're going to be seen that way, even if that's not your intention just by taking action and being of that background. Yeah. And I I think I did, I did a lot of things, right? Like I learned the language and I, like, I was so completely immersed. I definitely didn't drop in was like, okay, everybody roll up your sleeves. We're going to make this America. Like it it wasn't, I had read enough and studied enough and had enough mentorship to kind of know, but you still have those learning moments of like, how can I do this better? You know, there are some things like, okay, it's like menstruation in Nepal. Like when you're menstruating, as a woman in Nepal, you're supposed to sleep in a shed. That's part of the culture. As a young woman, you sleep in the shed and that's child putty. And as an, a foreigner or an outsider coming in, I'm looking at that being like, I can't have young girls go, I'm not going to sleep in a shed when I have my period because I'm tainted. No, that's wrong. And I stand against it and this and that. And there's like some certain tact that you need to navigate these deep and embedded cultural situations. And there are some things that you want to fight for, like a 13 year old getting married or having to drink cow urine when you're on your period and not be able to go to school. And there's other things that you accept and embrace and you see the beauty in the culture. And sometimes walking that line and knowing I'm an outsider and I have to accept this or no, this is something that we actively want to change is really critical. And Tope and our team really helped me with that and having a board helped me with that. But I look back and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have fought that fight or maybe I should have spoken up more there, but you learn. And again, I say this to all nonprofit leaders, just have a full, (laughs) have a full team around you and people to tell you like it is. And yeah, just stay humble in all of it and stay ready to learn and like ready to fall. Cause yeah, we all make mistakes. If you had followed the more traditional path and like ended up in college, maybe grad school, gotten a job uh, instead of this, and then followed this same path maybe 10 years later. Do you think you would have engaged with it the same way? Or was there, were there advantages to being naive and inexperienced to a degree? I think there are advantages. It's just what happened. And it's hard to imagine a different world. But I do know being 33 now that once you go to college, and yes, there, I think there's so much to be said for degrees and development, and we need it. We need these experts. We need people testing. And, and so much of what I learned is people in the sector that went and got really good degrees and did PhDs in the field. But there's something to be said for don't wait. Like our world can't wait for us to get a fancy degree and meet the right person and have all the money in the world to give back. What if we just started where we are with what we have and tried to make an impact? And I think we need more of that. 
what would I have done with all those college loans? You can't go out and like travel when you're $200,000 in college debt. There's something really practical. Like I probably would have needed to get a job and like pay off my loans and could have been at a bank or at a newspaper or working for Cosmo Girl Mac. Who knows what I would have become? I don't know what I would have studied or gotten my liberal arts degree in, but there is a trap when you have a life established somewhere. And I think there was something in me being young and no strings attached and free and having that powerful rite of passage to think like, what's going to be my impact in the world? And what, what can I do to make this place better? It was that was powerful. And it did something and I don't regret it. And thank goodness for those development PhDs who were there to guide me along the way, because I needed them. <laughs> I've needed every lawyer on my board and every finance person. <laughs> everybody is that's the beauty of blank now, I think like, the Wall Street guy is on my board and he's my chair and he's incredible. Like you can find those folks too. And I think the world needs everybody, but I just often think there is a trap of like college, 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 then you get a job and then you have to meet someone. And then you, especially a woman, you get married and you look a certain way and then you have kids and you're like a mortgage and a this and a that. And all of a sudden you're not thinking as much like, okay, how can I give back? How can I make an impact? So it really was a privilege. It was a privilege to like be out and free and thinking like, how do I make a dent on this riverbed? There's a middle ground, right? You don't want to go in blind or, or completely ignorant of development strategy or the situation or best practices. But if you're resourceful, you know, there, there are non-traditional ways of getting a great education. I think that's been a trend for years where people are trying to look for alternatives to the student loan university thing. There's so much learning online now, but especially now with COVID as now we really have to think about our education system. It's going to be interesting, right? Like, are people still going to pay $70,000 to go to school online at one of these elite universities? I do think that education is not this like one spectrum, one path. Like you and I are learning right now from each other. We're, we listen, we both love podcasts. Like I've gotten so much from podcasts and books and online courses. Like your education can be whatever it wants to be. And I just often caution folks from like thinking that it's a dotted line where you have to pay $70,000 a year. I think that's what I found for myself. You can find your own professors and teachers and mentors. If you're hungry and you want to learn and you're safe and educated and free and empowered enough, like you can do anything. I think just because somebody, somebody's in the situation like you found yourself in where they're, you know, having a unique experience and they see the need, see something that they want to become active in and change. And they don't necessarily have that background. There are ways to figure out how to do that well, I think at this point. Yeah, but I often think like, well, what's my advice to people? <laughs> Can I tell anyone else to do this? Would I be like, just go out and find something? And I think, yes, like, you know, if you're wary and you're conscious and you're finding a team of people and you have a passion, like that's what, like, we have to get ourselves out of this mess somehow. Like we need people who care about the bees and the whales and plastic and the oceans and what a gift if you can work on something like that, that you love and change the world and make something better for even one child. It matters. Like it's moving the needle forward and we need more of that. It's okay to start from wherever you are. Just start, right? Like don't feel intimidated to take action on something just because you don't have experience with it. Yeah. I often think, I think you and I talked about this before, but like people that say, well, one day I'll be rich and I'll give away a lot of money. Well, how rich? But like, when <laughs> like <laughs> right. you become a nine hundred ninety nine ninety nine dollar millionaire, then like my most powerful donors, the people who support us, are like waitresses who donate their tips, or an Uber driver that donates two rides from the day. Like it's everybody can do something, or give time, or give a little piece and everyone can recycle and reuse their cup. And it just takes a lot of us doing a lot of small actions. So I think, yeah, we have to be careful of like just putting it off forever. We all, I think that's our human condition, right? Just like whatever's in front of us. Yeah. The world can't wait. The problems are too <laughs> immediate. Especially right now. Doesn't it feel like the apocalypse a little bit? So I, I guess two questions can I come out of this. Let's, let's give them one at a time. So you, you mentioned like the importance of the server giving tips and the Uber driver and some of these smaller donors, which which can be, I think they're super important, but I know that they can often be overlooked by organizations, especially if they're more traditional philanthropy based. How do you guys think about these grassroots donors that you have? How do you engage with them? How do you make sure that they're getting what they want out of their interaction with Blink now, even though they've only, you know, maybe given five or 10 bucks? Yeah, the challenge is, is that our, the, our scope of work is, 
if you're in the States, it's 8,000 miles away. If you're in Kathmandu, it's a 20 hour bus ride away. So how do you make it real for people? And being able to see a child get their first pair of soccer cleats or like eat a meal when they haven't eaten for three days, it's probably the most powerful feeling you'll ever feel on this earth. That feeling of giving, seeing a child's come to school and be safe or saved from a child marriage or like this is life changing shit. It's crazy. Amazing. But we get to feel it because we're there. Our Nepali team, our social workers, our home caregivers, the people involved in the cases, but that donor giving the $5 a month doesn't get that warm and fuzzy feeling. We can send a picture. So for us and Ashley is our director of development and our team and our board. It's like, how do we make this experience real? without violating, you know, the rights of the child and telling their whole story. Like, how do we do this ethically? So um, I think we've leveraged social media, Instagram, Facebook, like having the kids, you see it and you feel it and you feel like you're there. It's, It's really important. Our donor relationships, like we're small enough that like every single donor matters. We know who they are. We know their names. We're like constantly like Ashley and I are texting. Did you see that? Like we got $2,400 this week. That's real for us. You know, like we're jumping up and down and then you're on the ground and you feel it. So just making that experience real and trying to tell the story and explain to people how vitally important and life-changing it is and showing and not telling we try not to like guilt trip people like you have everything you should it's just really like hey you have a powerful opportunity to make an impact and change someone's life Uh, what Ashley brought on board to us was our monthly giving program and I always tell other nonprofits if you don't have one get one like tomorrow (laughs) well why you know flesh that because I agree with you I'm a big proponent of those but like what's what's the difference that's made for blank now for a small organization like us we have maybe like 20 donors giving the big bucks and we love those people they're like our best friends they're on our board (laughs) I call them on the regular I mean but how many people is that like the average you and I millennial, someone just starting out in their career um, on their first job, the average person, they can wrap their hands and their brain around a Netflix subscription. Oh, I pay this much for Netflix or, oh, I'm probably spending too much on coffee out. I pray that like everybody gets a big money bomb dropped and that big philanthropic dollars are there, but there's incredible good causes and there's so many foundations and everybody has their own passion. And so it's finding like the right match and there's so much to care about. And there's only so many people that can write that really, truly big influential check. And there's a lot more of us who can say, you know what? I can give $10 a month. I can do 20. I can do 30. I cannot go out one night a week for dinner. And because then the founding story, every $5 mattered that continues today. Tope and I will like be at a fruit stand just like negotiating over, no, like give us the daily rate. And probably because of our babysitting, my babysitting background and Tope's background as a porter, like carrying bags for 10 cents. Like we just, I think it's really in our ethos that it matters. And when I read through our classy donor reports, it's just like, these are people. These are like Nepalese people from around the world. This is somebody who I just have never, I've tried to never lose sight of a $20 donation, looking back at like that first envelope, that first yard sale, selling a dog leash for 25 cents. Like I just never want to lose it because it matters. And the little like 25 cents is a meal for a child that hasn't eaten. Like money is powerful. And when used and channeled properly, it can change a life. So. Well, just the $2,400 you mentioned, that's two years for a child, right? Yeah. And making it real, like we're really good at like, let's take all of our budget and make it real to people and give it bite size, you know, like what's for like, everybody's in a different situation, has a different financial portfolio. And you could be sitting across from a multimillionaire. It's like about finding what's important to them too. Like, what do you care about? And like, it might be sustainability and you could do a cow or like, it might be a year of education, or maybe you were a nurse and you want to fund a nursing scholarship or Like, I don't ever want giving to be like a guilt trippy thing. I want it to be like, this is so cool. Look at what you did. I want people to have that feeling that I had when Hema went to school. It was just like, this is addicting. I want to do this forever. Like, this is fun. Look at that. My greatest wish in the world would be that everyone has that feeling because that feeling is 
it's, it's what we live for. There's nothing better than seeing somebody's life transform because like, that's what we're here for to take care of each other and support each other and lift each other up. Just real quick ball, ballpark. How many monthly donors do you think you have at this point? Give or take a thousand, a thousand monthly donors average of how much does it bring in each month? It probably brings in, Oh my gosh, I should know the exact figure about 12 to $15,000 a month. Every single month. Yeah. How impactful has that been for you guys? Just to have that, to, to be able to count on that revenue and not have to go chase it down every time. We tell these, we tell our root supporters that like they're our bread and butter, they're our family, just to be able to rely on them. And we send them newsletters and I try to write to each of them and we, you know, we'll try to meet them for lunch when we're, <laughs> we're so small, but we, we, yeah, we try to make it really personal and let people know what it means. Yeah. It's, it's huge. In terms of your ability to grow though, like that, that pays for your teachers, I, I assume, like in large part. Exactly. I mean, it could be anything, right? Like something could break and you're like, okay, I know we're going to be able to cover that bill or it's really, it's been critical. You were in Nepal when COVID hit, you know, what was that like? And I, I know you were kind of, you were there for, for a while because it was hard to travel. Uh, what was the impact that COVID um, has had on, on your community um, in Nepal and on Blink now in general? Like, how are you guys adapting to it? No, thanks for talking about that. When COVID hit, we had all of these plans, just like everyone else. We had this small window where our biggest supporters come and they come to our programs and all of a sudden that was off. All of a sudden our programs had to close down. There was a lot of fear and confusion about like, what does this mean? What's happening? Like donors start emailing that they're losing their jobs. And we looked at our budget and we cut 30%. Where did those cuts come from? Well, some of them were easy, like travel and because we're all just staying home, right? But we took some programmatic cuts, any kind of software for case management or nothing didn't get cut. We started to open up a food bank, but then you're like, okay, well, we're cutting everything. How can we like start making sure that people are fed and kept safe and we have to pivot programs and how do we keep our kids safe when they're not coming to school? So everything just changed. Our women's center, everything changed and we had to move to like a remote model in a country without internet and power. Like <laughs> we can't just like change over to online learning. Again, we, we figured it out and we, our social workers were working around the clock, our health and wellness team, teachers started making calls, doing distance home visits. We started doing food drops. We opened a government food bank. We started working with the government because we're so close to community. I feel like we're really tapped into what's happening. So we started liaisoning with the government and just being a voice, connecting to bigger aid organizations. At that point, we kind of went from like, oh my gosh, this is really scary for us as a nonprofit. Do we furlough? Do we stop paying people? We can't run programs to like, we need to save as many lives as possible and feed as many people as possible. And we need to tell that story. And when we did that, people responded. It was kindness and generosity and those roots givers gave an extra gift and donors stepped up and people who had anything people that got that check from the government just handed it right over to us and nepali influencers came forward and we created like a movement around changing stigma and, and raising awareness on migrant food and hunger crisis and quarantine centers so it went from like us how are we going to survive this to like as a collective whole and a country and a humanity and a region what do we do we're nervous about what it means for our children in our community and people who are already like on the brink and also nervous about what it means for this industry as a whole. You focus on a very specific region and you mentioned actually not having any ambitions to expand directly beyond that, which I think is somewhat unique, but that you, you know, you are open to sort of sharing what you've learned and, and empowering other organizations to kind of replicate what you've done in, in their own target communities. Can you talk a little bit about, about that vision and, and kind of how you plan to execute on that? Yeah, so our, the, the last and final goal of our strategic plan is inspiring others. And as we've kind of grown and developed and learned a lot <laughs> and made our mistakes, there's been a lot of space for like talking and sharing, modeling and more partnership. And I think it's something that's lacking in the space and the field in general. 
just like how can we learn from each other? How can we improve best practices? And so we've been taking in like lots of just folks under our wing and being like, okay, this is how you do that. And oh, we made this mistake too. And here, like, let us help you develop, you know, your monthly giving program or here's your women's center curriculum. We grabbed from this and oh, we learned this along the way. So even in just building that school that took us seven years. <laughs> Uh, it did turn out to be this beautiful green dream off the grid school. And through all of those learnings, like we can kind of teach other people, okay, this is how you create a solar unit and a solar cooker and rainwater harvest. Again, going back to that initial principle that we were talking about, about this field in general lacking like quality and best practices and how do we kind of share and kind of improve the standards. I feel like there's a lot of space for that right now in the for purpose nonprofit development field in general just how do we work together how do we all improve it's sad because because we're so under resourced as a as an industry it doesn't always allow for like time to be like okay what are you doing let's all get together and talk about it and i want to see us all evolve and become that as a field like how, how do we how do we do better how can we do this more efficiently quicker because we're in such a bad situation we don't have time to mess around like we need to unite and work together and, and get some of the stuff figured out as soon as possible. So I, we've, we've kind of found that in our little niche of orphan care, child rearing and school and women's center and some of the green work that we do and very community based and focused. And in that model, if you do just want to draw a little circle around a specific region and chip away at it, that we do feel like we have something to teach and to inspire. Awesome. So, so a few quick questions as we wrap up. Outside of what you're currently working on, what do you think the most important cause for humanity to tackle is and why? I'd say the environment. I had this awakening when I was raising kids and we were like, okay, what do we do next? Okay, women, like, let's make sure we support the caregivers, clean water, uh, like immunizations and soccer program. And then at some point, you're like taking your kids to the river on a camping trip and it's filled with plastic. The trees are all being cut down and you're just like, what if... We're trying to create this world for them to live in that's better in every opportunity, but what if there isn't a world? I don't know about you, but I have like some serious environmental anxiety right now. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would agree. For, for me, that's education and social justice and mental health are all very important, but the existential threat to me is really the environmental stuff. I started becoming sensitive to it. You know, I, I love the ocean. I love wild animals and seeing the impact on them. And then, I, you know, when you start getting into displaced people due to climate, yeah, we haven't we haven't been the best custodians <laughs> of the earth. The the poor and the vulnerable and those people up against social justice, they're the ones that are impacted the most. Like people living completely off the grid, subsistence farming on their Himalayan mountain, just trying to raise a family and their animals, they're the ones that are affected the most by those Himalayan springs mel melting from global warming. And you realize like so much of this is environmental. Yeah, well, I think even living in the Western world, you're in Canada, I'm in California, like the West Coast is burning right now. It is on fire. But even myself, like the air started getting bad in San Diego and I took off to Vegas for a week to get into fresh air. The wildfires are obviously connected to climate and they're affecting directly many people here. But people here have options. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know what you're going to do in Micronesia when the sea level rises or you can no longer grow rice in certain regions that depend on it. It's really true how do we address it? Like, how do we, like, what do you do? Where do you start beyond like, we put solar panels on our roof and we're teaching the kids to be plastic free, but like, it just seems like there has to be such a major overhaul. And it, again, I know we need to look at the small problems, but when you're, when you and I are in North America breathing in smoke, it gets really flippant scary. Yeah. It'd be some hard choices. When you sort of are ready for retirement and, and ready to pass the baton, what will you, you know, looking back on your career and your life in, in social impact, what will you hope to have accomplished in that career? If I live enough, if I live long enough to get to see my children and my children's children and have them go and do things in the world and for other people and help create this ripple of change. And I always say like when I'm old and gray and on my little rocking chair on the front porch, like that my grandchildren and great grandchildren would look at me and be like, did that really happen? Were people really hungry? Did kids really not even get to go to school? Like, was the world on fire? Like, I'd love 
for us to like all really believe that this is possible because we know they are now. Like we know that we can eradicate world hunger. We know that we can move the needle forward. We know that every child should be able to go to primary school. But like, can we do it in our lifetime? Can we make it so that every child has like a fighting chance? That would be the ultimate. And just kind of like sitting around with all my kids and grandkids and being surrounded by them and seeing all the things that they do and what they become would be, I think that would be the definition of a happy life feeling like I did something. That's really powerful. So, so instead of like, you know, I had to walk uphill both ways to, to work that our grandparents, like <laughs> when I was younger, people didn't have enough food or water or education or the, the world was on fire. Yeah. But, I mean, think about it. Like we kind of look back on some of those ages. Really? Did that happen? Did that really happen? Like it's not impossible to envision a time where they look back at us in 2020. Like that really went down. Like, oh my God. How did that happen? Really? Like what, what did it take for people to realize it's not complicated to balance the scales a little more? In my younger years, I thought like, oh, this is totally possible. This is easy. We can do this. I think right now I'm a little like, oh, is it going to happen? Well, it won't if people don't, more people don't get involved and, and start making sacrifices and harder choices and stepping up when you see a problem and don't know how to solve it. Instead of letting that deter you, you know, figure, figure it out as you did. What's next for Blink now? And what can anybody listening to this podcast do to support your work? Next for Blink Now, we need more space for our growing children's home. We've filled up every bedroom. <laughs> just like we just have kids coming in all the time. So we're, we're trying to grow and expand within, within our home. Also just survive this year with COVID. Continue to be who we are. Continue to be a leader and a teacher. And um, for people to follow along, we're blinknow.org. So we're all over social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Become a Roots member. Check us out. Share the story. We'd love for you to follow along. I think we'll leave it there for today. Thank you for listening and a big thank you to Maggie for sharing her time and her stories with us. If you want to learn more about Blink Now, you can visit their website at www.blinknow.org and on our website at causeandpurpose.com. Our conversation with Maggie ran for nearly two hours and she's got a lot of great stories that didn't quite make it into the finished episode. We'll be releasing some of them along with additional content from all of our past episodes in the months ahead. Cause and Purpose is a production of Moonshot.co. On behalf of myself, Maggie Doyne and our entire team. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon.